All righty, so we're going to kind of go off into La La Land and talk about inheritance and polymorphism. I'm not even sure how many examples of this that I'm going to give. Most object-oriented languages require the program to master the following techniques. Data encapsulation. What is data encapsulation? It's preventing the program or people using your class from directly manipulating the variables that are stored in that class. And instead, they have to use the methods in order to get to the data. And the reason you do that is to make sure that your class maintains valid data at all times. So for example, we had a fraction class and maybe we've decided that it's illegal for the denominator, the bottom, to be set to zero. And if we give the calling class or you know, the calling code, the main code access to that variable, to that bottom variable, then they can corrupt its data, right? They can set it to an invalid state. Or suppose that you have something that's supposed to represent, you know, a numeric value, but it's just not supposed to ever be allowed to go negative. You just cannot have a negative of this value. But if you give the calling code direct access to it, then, then the programmer using your code, or, you know, if you make a mistake, can make a, um, can mess it up. So in some languages, you have the word private. And when you define a class, and this is just kind of like real general, um, I'm just typing this into uh, a text editor because we're not gonna, I'm not expecting you to take these as notes. You define a class and you give it a name, right? And then you could say in those languages, that this is a private variable. You know, that the top and the bottoms are private. So that when you're ready to create your fraction class, um, fraction object, if I did, if I did fraction, and again, this is a completely different language format, so it looks di very different. But after I create a new fraction, then if I try to set the top to something like that, the compiler won't allow that. The compiler will say, no, you're trying to set a private variable. You can't do that. And then you have another keyword called public, which would make it so that the client code count down here can actually change that variable. So guess what? Python doesn't have the ability. Python doesn't have a private keyword. And yet we're supposed to maintain that concept in our head of you know, in data encapsulation. So in forcing data encapsulation to happen, you can't do it in Python. You cannot prevent the client code, someone using your class from changing these pieces of data. So theoretically, if I knew the names of all the variables in the turtle class, for example, I could be changing the state information directly. So I could change the speed of it by changing a variable rather than by making a function call or something like that. So something that people do in Python programs is if it's supposed to be a private variable, they stick an underscore in front of its name or two underscores in front of its name or whatever, just to indicate that no, you're not, just like um, it's a gentleman's agreement that if a variable is in all in caps, we're supposed to treat it as a constant because Python doesn't have the ability to mark a variable as a constant. So I'm not sure I'm gonna actually demonstrate that. But let's go ahead and do another class example or two. Well, let's keep going with this. And then inheritance. Inheritance is the ability to make one class that has all the capabilities of another class, but more. And then polymorphism is the ability to have several different classes use the same method names. Now, so a physical object, you can have an inanimate object that is a phys physical object. Inheritance provides an is a structure. So far, what we've done with classes is have a has a structure, a fraction has a top, and a fraction has a bottom. But 
This is an is a structure. An inanimate object is a physical object, and a stone is an inanimate object, and so is an asteroid. In the meantime, a mammal is a living thing, which is a physical object. So these are inheritance hierarchies, where this is what's known as the root class or the superclass, depending upon which textbook you read. And then these are the subclasses or the child classes. Now, since we've only talked about classes for like one day, I don't think that we really need to get into um, doing a great big example of inheritance. But what I do want you to know is that what this means is that the living thing has all of the variables and all of the methods of its parent class plus more. And then the mammal has all of the methods of this class, which includes that one, plus more. And then the cat has all the methods and the variables of this class, which has all of those, which has all of those, plus more, right? So as you go down the hierarchy chain, you're getting into more and more capable objects, right? Because they have all the methods of everything in the hierarchy above them. Yeah, this is all pretty cryptic. I'm not going to really be talking about this too much. It's not a kind of this. Let's see. So we subclass when two classes share a substantial amount of abstract behavior. The classes have a similar sets of methods and operations. And the subclass should add something extra. So the two classes have to have the same interface. One or more methods in a subclass will override the definitions of the same methods in a superclass to provide specialized versions of the abstract behavior. And I think that these PowerPoints are so sparse that they're not gonna actually give us any examples of this stuff. And that's usually okay. Usually I like just giving you my own examples. All right, I think it'd be better off if we just gave more practical examples of classes rather than working about working on giving examples of hierarchies of inheritance chains. So we're on lecture U, looks that way to me. is correct. All right, so how about a class that represents somebody's name? And somebody can have a first name, a middle name, and a last name. So, what we'll do is we'll do class name. And then in our init function, we will initialize three variables, a first name, a minimal, a minimal, a middle name, and a last name. So two underscores there, init, two underscores. And then we have to pass the self-reference in. We're also going to pass in three variables, right? A first and a middle and a last. But I'm going to set them to default. And we talked about default parameters in a prior lecture. To defaulting to emptiness, right? To empty strings. So we can create a name object and it might have absolutely no information in it. It might not have a first, it might not have a middle, and it might not have a last. But we still have to support that, so we're gonna do this dot first equals first. No, 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 self dot first equals first. Self dot middle equals middle, and self dot last equals last. And now, let's provide a function to return 
our name is a string. So DEF underscore underscore STR underscore underscore self. Always have to have that self parameter as the first thing for every method in your class. Now let's just return. Let's make a string, which is self dot first plus self dot middle plus self dot last and then return s. All right, since we provided default values, we have the option of specifying which kinds of data we want to create it with. Right, I could do this as n1 is equal to name like that. That's going to be an empty name. n2 is equal to name with the first name only, right? Bob. N3 is equal to a name with, you know, first equals Bob, end quote, comma, last equals, you know, Roberts, like that. And this is going to look kind of stupid, isn't it? Because it's going to um, jam all the, uh, the names together with no spaces between them. So we'll definitely need to go and fix that. But just for giggles, let's go ahead and print our names out. SAQ? Yeah. No, you. All right. So the first name was Bob and the second name was Bob Roberts. Maybe I shouldn't have printed them all in the same row because that makes it kind of hard to see what's going on. Right. All right, so name one is completely empty. Name two has got the first name. The third name has got a first and a last name. And we never created one with all three names filled in, right? But we could. John, Hugh, Adams, right? Like that. We could print that out as well. Okay, so obviously the string function is not adequate because it's not putting spaces between things. And then there's going to be another problem as well with the format of our string, of our name, which is going to, it's going to have extra spaces in it, right? Once we start adding the spaces, it's going to have spaces in it if we're not careful. What do I mean by that? If I just do this, That's a little bit better. At least the output's gonna have spaces in it, but in some cases it's gonna have too many spaces. Oh, where'd my plus sign go? There we go. Right, so here Bob Roberts has a space in the middle of it. I mean, we can't really tell, but he's got two extra spaces at the end. I'm going to change this to using the formatted string just because it's easier to do what I'm about to do. So F quote name equals single quote curly brace in one in curly brace in single quote in double quote. That was supposed to be a single quote. I said single quote and managed to type an apostrophe. There we go, right. So that will be substituted with the actual name of the variable. So it's going to say name is equal to, you know, Bob or whatever, but it's gonna have quotes around it. And the reason I wanna do that is so that we can 
you know, examine the contents of it and see that it has spaces around the first and the last, you know, parts of it where we may not want that. All right. So to my mind, it's not looking too hot. We have all these extra spaces here that we might not want. One more example is what if they type in just two names and then don't provide the last name, right? So like, you know, Sam Clemens, like that. Now this is striking me that it's not the best example that I could have come up with if I thought harder about, oh, I never printed it out. And I don't know how to fix it without giving it a little bit of thought. But if I give you two names, it's likely that I want this one to be the first name and this one to be the last and then there for be no middle name. But I'm not gonna take any time to figure out that. Okay, so we see that there's an extra space at the end. And if we had not, if we use this kind of specifications where we did first and last, then we could wind up with names that had no first name, right? We could do n6 is equal to name, you know, last is equal to slash. Let's pretend this slash is his last name. And then the rest of them are gonna be blank when we print it out. And I forgot to add the printout for it. All right, so what could I do to make this look a lot better? Well, I really don't know. Um, I mean, I know one quick fix is that I could replace all double spaces with single spaces. And then I could try to check to see whether there's a space at the end and then remove it, or if there's a space at the beginning and then remove it. But I'm just gonna leave that alone. Uh, the point of this is the class, not the, uh, you know, not the manipulation of it, not the manipulation of strings. I guess replacing double spaces with single spaces is so easy that we might as well do that. So here's what I'm gonna do is say S is equal to S dot replace parentheses quote, double space end quote comma, quote, single space. And I guess it wouldn't be that hard to remove the first and the last spaces, if they had one, like if our name looked like this at that point, all we have to do is check to see if the first position is zero. And if it is, then we could use slicing to get rid of that. So why not? So if string at position zero is equal to a space, then we wanna get rid of that. So string equals string, and then using slicing, start at position one and go all the way to the end of the string. And then we can do that at the end of the string as well. So if the string at the last position is equal to that, then this string needs to be equal to the string starting at zero and going all the way up to the second to the last character. And honestly, I don't know if that's gonna work. Let's, uh, let's validate that that syntax works. So if I have a string like this, and I want to, get everything but the last character, S is equal to S starting at zero and going all the way up to the second to the last character. Is that gonna work? Nope. So I should have made it minus one. And that makes sense because the second position specifies, you know, like if I did zero and three and four on this one, 
then it would give me zero, one, two, three, because just like a range statement, the second number specifies one past where you're going. String index out of range. All righty, and in this case, we're making, we're manipulating strings that are perhaps empty, right? See, I knew I shouldn't have gone off on this. If the string was empty to begin with, we can't start doing all this kind of uh, representational stuff. You know, if it's an empty string, there is no position zero and negative one and stuff like that. So I guess by doing that, Maybe that's what broke it. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to put an if statement that says if the string is of zero length after it runs. All right, well, see, it still left that. We could make this a while statement. While. Yeah, this, if we change this to a while, this is going to eat all the spaces at the beginning of it, right? While the first character of the string is a space, ignore that character getting all the rest. And while the last character of it is a space, keep getting everything but the last character. Or not. Well, that was all fun. I'm just going to ignore the rest of this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to even fix it. Broken idea. Right. Okay. So it's a simple example of having a class that's a conglomeration of data. It doesn't have much data in it. It just has a first and a middle and a last, you know, and the ability to give it default values, in which case we just gave it default values of empty. Our string that we build here, perhaps we should not have bothered trying to make it look all fancy, you know, just as a string representation like that. Maybe I should have just done something like this. The string is equal to, you know, name first equals end quote plus self dot first. And then let's add on to that. So string plus equals last or middle equals self dot middle, right? And then let's tack this on one more time. And the last is equal to there, like that. And yeah, looking pretty bad there, but we're getting the idea. We could put spaces there and it's finally gonna look about okay. Okay, so I guess one thing we could do is if the middle was empty and if the first was empty and the last was empty, not even show those in the output in the string output, but I'm, I'm not gonna take it that far. Okay, so the idea of data encapsulation. Define a class, no, 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 class. And we don't want to allow somebody's age to be set negative. And we don't want to allow empty first names and empty last names. So we're gonna need three pieces of information that our init class is gonna have to initialize. And so we need, you know, a first name, we need a last name, and we need an age. And we could let this fill it in, right? 
self. Tell you what, let's not even allow them to fill it in at the beginning as they're creating it. Now, normally I do. Normally a constructor ought to be convenient, to make the class convenient to use, and you have to fill in everything, you know, as you create the object. But just for the sake of this purpose, we're not, we're not going to allow them to set the variables by passing them in as arguments to that function. So instead, set first, self comma first. And then we can say self dot first equals first. Define set last, self comma last. Self dot last is equal to that parameter. And define set age self comma age, self dot age equals age, like that. So when we wanna create a person, you know, Bob equals a person, and then we can set his values, right? Or let, let's give that a more generic name, like P1. P1 dot set first, his name is Bob, P1 dot set last, his name is Roberts. And P1 dot set age to 32. So what could we do here? I guess we could you know, at least validate that the age is not negative. So if age is less than zero, print error, age cannot be less than zero, else that. And this was dumb, by the way. Why would I initialize an age variable to an empty string? I just got into that pattern of doing that. It should have been like that. Okay, so we have done a little bit of data valid, uh, validation here. We're not allowing the programmer using our class or ourselves to set age to a negative value, right? So if we tried to set it to a negative value, we would get an error message. Let's first prove that it actually runs. All right, so if I made that a negative value, I'm gonna get my little error message. Now let's add a string method to make a string from it just so that we can see what it looks like. So S is equal to the formatted string version of person first equals curly brace self dot first in curly brace comma last equals curly brace self dot last in curly brace comma age equals self dot age in curly brace end quote and then we we can return that string so let's print out out the person there. All right? So now it's kind of silly to have error messages actually be kicked out by the class itself like that. Um, but it's a good enough way for us to demonstrate the idea of protecting the integrity of the state information. Age was not allowed to get negative. So data encapsulation is the idea of not encouraging access to those variables directly, but requiring them to use getters and setters. And what do getters look like? Well, they just look like this. Define get name, parentheses, self in parentheses, colon, return self dot name, um, first, sorry, get first.
find get last, right? It's going to return self dot last. Define get age self is going to return self dot age. And the syntax is legal, by the way. And there we go. Right. <laughs> Anyways, now they would be able to get that information out if they needed to. Print the person's first name is in quote comma p1 dot get first. All right. So is there anything stopping us from just saying age is equal to 17, right? Or negative 17 and then printing them out again. No, nothing prevented us from doing that. And if the language had the ability to prevent that, then it would be on par with some other object oriented programming languages like Java and C++. Private member variables, Python. Let's see what that has to say. Python does not have private variables. You can access any member variable at any time. However, you don't need private variables because in Python, it is not bad to expose your class member variables. All right, anyways, if you really, really, really wanted to discourage this kind of stuff, the recommendation is, is that you go and put an underscore in front of the variable as you're creating it. And I, I'm not gonna do that, but I'm gonna give you the idea. Well, I mean, I guess I'm gonna do it because I'm showing it to you first right here, right? But anyways. So you see what I'm saying? Um, in order for them to be able to change that variable down here, they would have to say, oh, why did I do that? Age equals 17. That was not my intention. I hope that the uh, the fact that I would have to do that, p1 dot underscore age, should just be a clue to me. Oh, you really shouldn't be changing that. That data is encapsulated. You really should use only the functions that allow you to change it, to change it, rather than change it directly. So, but it, it makes the code hard to read. But yeah, I, I do see it a lot. So it is one way of doing that. Now I'm gonna undo all those changes because I think that they make it harder to read. Generally, the rule of thumb is, is that if there is a function, if there is a method, that is supposed to be used to get and set that value, that is the one that you as a programmer should be using, even if you happen to know the name of the variable that it's modifying underneath and feel like setting it directly. You're kind of working around, you know, things if you go ahead and, uh, and reach into the class and change things directly, even though there was a setter for it. So this works, but we have now damaged the integrity of our object. He's got a negative age, whereas we did not want to allow negative ages. That's why we provided a setter for it. Okay, so data encapsulation. Protect the data's integrity by providing functions that set or and get the data. Get functions, colloquially called getters, are known as accessors in the textbooks. And set functions, informally known as setters, are called mutators because they change it, right? Just like the uh, Gamma ray radiation mutated Hulk's genes. If you're changing something, you're mutating it. Okay, so if a class offers setters, that's a signal to you to use those setters rather than change 
the underlying values of the class variables directly. So in the example above, set age has a protection to stop the age member variable from being set negative. So we should always use set age. Okay, I just got an error message. Um, is everybody still online? Um, everybody still here with me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm still here. All right, it, it just told me that my internet connection was unstable. I guess Zoom picked up that my throughput wasn't fast enough. I don't know why I did that. Interesting, frightening. Yeah, yesterday I recorded an hour and a half long lecture and then Zoom froze the computer. Yeah, it just froze like two seconds ago. And so my entire computer was locked and I had to reboot it and I was terrified that I'd lost the lecture and was going to have to record it. But then when I rebooted it, it said, you have an unconverted video, would you like to convert it? And so I was able to recover from it. Okay, so we should always use set age rather than setting, you know, the A or rather than assigning a value directly to the age variable itself. Hope that makes sense. Hope that makes sense. This is not a class for teaching object oriented programming. I just want you to have the concepts of how to create a class and how to use it. And adding getters and setters is a computer science, computer science -y kind of thing to do, but you don't have to do it right? You could just create your class, stick some variables in it, and then run from there. But I did want to demonstrate that idea. So are we uh, back on? Can you still see my screen or did I? Yeah, you're, you're back on. Okay, that's cool. Okay, so back to the idea of creating those kind of geometric classes that have some kind of information and a get surface area and get volume kind of thing. I'm gonna redo the circle example. Excuse me, I'm gonna do a sphere example. No, no, because that was the homework. How about do a, a, an example where we just create something that has a density and a volume and it'll return the mass. So, can't even come up with a good name for that one. I guess I will call it material. So class material. And the init function for it. It's going to take a name of the material and it's going to take a density of the material and then the volume of the material. And so self.name is equal to name, self.density is equal to density and self.volume is equal to volume. And I've decided just to even get rid of the idea of the name. Nah, okay, so what can you do when you have those kinds of things? Well, then we could create a get mass method and mass is just density times volume, right? So define get mass self. And what does this do? The mass is equal to 
self dot density times self dot volume. Return the mass. And so we could make a, a material, right? M1 is equal to material and the density of this one is, you know, 0.5 and we have a hundred. Now we, who knows what our units are, right? Cubic centimeters and, and grams or something like that would be, you know, a likely assumption. M2 is equal to material, you know, this one has a density of two and we have 50 grams of it. And M3 is equal to material, whatever, right? It's got a density of 55 and we have seven grams of it. Well, let's stick those in an array list. Let's stick those in a list. So my list is like that, it's an empty list. Now I'm going to add those things to it. L dot append, the first material to it. L dot append, the second material to it. And L dot append, the third material. And now I feel like adding up the masses of all three of those things. So total mass is equal to zero. And then for value in the list, the total mass plus equals the values get mass, like that. And then let's print the total mass. And just because it's gonna be hard for us to figure out if it's working correctly or not, because I don't have these numbers already plugged into my brain. I'm going to print the masses as we extract them, right? So print adding end quote comma, and then let's get the mass of that particular element in the list, v.get mass. Come on, there. So that way we'll just see adding, 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 and it'll calculate the, the masses of those three materials. And so that worked, right? Need to check something. Please don't freeze on me. Okay. So we did a fraction example, a block frac example, a circle example. you could use classes as data inside another class. And what do I mean by that? I'm not gonna take this anywhere far at all, but I could declare a patient and that patient has a name. Right, and here we're using that class that we did up there. And this is totally silly, but a patient also has a material, right? And a patient also has, you know, whatever else we defined. A patient is also a person. And material does not have any default values. So when we create it, we actually do have to give it the starting parameters. We did not give it any default values for the arguments on material. And we didn't on person either. 
but person doesn't take any arguments. So that would be safe, but for it to not crash, it would have to be, a, right, we'd have to give some kind of values there. And I'm not gonna take that far at all, but you can see that this is called composition when a class has elements of another class in it, right? So the patient does have a name, the patient is a person, I know that's stupid, and the patient is made out of some kind of material. And so we have several different components here. That's a silly example, but I'm just gonna nuke that. But what if you had a point class, right? Define point, excuse me, I keep doing that, class point, and the init function for that, took an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, but maybe they default to zero if no value is provided. And then so self.x equals x, self.y equals y. And then if we wanted to convert it to a string, string is equal to point, x equals, end quote, plus the string version of x, and then now add the y coordinate for it. So s plus equals, that's not gonna work because I didn't call it self.x. Okay, what I'm gonna do, just to keep us on our toes, so point, x equals placeholder, y equals placeholder, end quote, dot format, self dot x comma self dot y, right? And we could return that string. So if we wanna create some points, we can. P1 is equal to point with no, no parameters offered. P2 is equal to point with, you know, an x and a y value set. And then we could print P1 equals comma P1. And we can print P2 equals in quote comma P2. But then we can make a class that uses the point. Now in geometry, I believe that a line segment is just two points, right? And a triangle could be defined by three points or a circle could have a point representing where it is, right? So define circle, class circle, EF, the init function for this takes its cell and then it's got a radius and it's got an X value and a Y value. Again, we're gonna provide default values for these so that they don't have to specify an X and a Y value if they don't want to, but we're gonna make them specify a radius. And so in this case, a radius is equal to that, right? But then we have a point, self dot. All right, guys, what's the, uh, the center point of a circle called in geometry? Just the center. Center, okay. So yeah, it's equal to point, you know, filled in with X comma Y, like that, right? So he has a point that's part of him, that's composition. Composition is when an object maintains exclusive ownership of its data, but then there's another form where you called aggregation to where pieces of data can be all owned by multiple objects and heaven forbid, we're not gonna talk about that. But the idea behind that would be is like a, a car lot would have exclusive ownership of the cars that are for sale. But on the other hand, the employees might be, you know, two-timing on their bosses and work at multiple car dealerships, right? So it's a, so an object composition relationship the uh, dealership exclusively owns the cars, so that's composition, 
but the employees might be shared between multiple dealerships. So that's an aggregation relationship. I'm not gonna bother to talk about that. All of our examples here are composition. This object is manages its data and that data applies to this specific object. Not going to flesh that one out. Anywhere else to go with these concepts? So for example, you could create a book class, a book as a title and an author. And a publisher, or how about just the number of pages? Three things there, right? And then the homework for that could be, you know, write the class, provide, get title, get author, and get pages methods, provide setters, right? Set title, set author, and set pages methods. And then add an STR method to convert the book to a string. And then have the client code create three different books, printing them out. So the book class has three member variables. If you feel like putting a constructor in there that allow it to set title, author, and pages, you could do that. But you also need to provide the getters and the setters, or you could make the, uh, the init function just not do anything. And that's the tactic that we did up here, right? So in this case, the constructor isn't accepting any arguments. He will brook no argument, but the constructor is initializing the class's member variables to default values, All right? That makes sense. Okay, we're gonna make it a little bit more interesting. A publisher and a number of pages and a year published, right? So I'm gonna change this to say, about methods for all member variables, provide set title, set author, et cetera, methods for all member variables. And it now has five member variables rather than three. Now this one doesn't have the class serving as anything other than a repository for data, right? There's no cool little functions for calculating the surface area of a book or doing any math on it or anything like that. But All righty. 
I want to go and take a look at the quiz for this chapter because I did assign it and I want to see if I'm going to worry that it's a little bit too weird. So let's go see. So what is the purpose of the init method in a class? Does it build an instance variable? Mm -hmm. Does it build and return a string representation? No, that's the STR method. Does it set all the variables in the class definition and null? Well, you know, it could, but don't see why we'd want to do that. Set the instance variables to initial values. That's what it should be, right? I don't know what create an instance variable means. Definitely setting the initial, hope that's correct. We'll find out. So a method definition. Is it true that a method can have zero or more parameter names. I think it has to have one parameter name. Let's try that experimentally. I'm gonna come up here and define a class with an init method or, you know, class test. You know, and then define underscore init. hello <laughs> and then let's define another function method with no parameters so t is equal to test and then t dot test let's see if it can call this function right here and it's not going to be able to because we did not provide the self parameter Yeah, test takes zero positional arguments, but one was given. I didn't give it an argument. Why is it saying that there was an argument given? Well, because it's part of a function. Excuse me, it's part of an object. And so any object call, any call to an object's methods passes in the self-reference automatically, even though we don't see it. It's like it's doing that. It's like every time you made, you made a method call, that that variable was there, right? It's like every time that I wanted to, I haven't used very many of these. Like when we called get mass, it passed in a reference to that object. Now it's not. We don't have to do that, right? It happens automatically. So that's certainly not a good answer. Can re returns a value of true when no return statement is included? Well, that's certainly not true. What is the default value for a method or a function if you don't actually have a return? Does anybody didn't know that? If I do this, if I do def wow, and all it's gonna do is print wow, right? And then I say x is equal to wow, and then I print x, what is that gonna be? Anybody know? going to be the word none. It's a special keyword, which is a return value for a function that doesn't return a value. Oh, I never fixed this. Right. So it's like was doing that. 
This happens at the end of every function that does not have a return statement on it. And so you could take advantage of that, I suppose, somehow. Like you could check the return value of a function and if the return value was none, you know the function failed. I don't know. But anyways, that is the return value from a function if there is no return statement. All functions or methods return none if there is no return value specified in the code. So even if I just did this, right, even if I had the return keyword, but I didn't specify a value, it's still going to print none there. But if I make it return something, right, then it would print zero instead. So in that case, wow returns zero. And if we took that back out, So returning a true with no return statement, that's not correct. Always must have at least one parameter name self. That's absolutely true. If it's a method, it's gonna have a self parameter name. Now the name it, of the variable itself, okay, I've, I've, I've gone into that already. I wish that it was called this rather than self just because that's the one that all the other programming languages I've ever learned use. Must contain at, one, at least one subclass, well heck no. All right, so we know it's, that it's one of those. We know that it's the self one. The scope of an instance variable. An instance variable scope. The statements in the body of the method where it is introduced. Well, an instance variable is accessible to all of the methods in the class. So I'm hoping that that's the correct answer, right? That's the entire reason for creating an instance variable. Well, what's an instance variable? It sees ones that begin with self, right? Self.radius, that's an instance variable. Self.center, that's an instance variable. Why is it called an instance variable? Because it applies to a specific instance. instance. Each circle has its own radius and each circle has its own center. You can also have what are known as class variables, which are variables that are shared by all instances of the class. So class variables are shared by all objects of that class type, all objects, parentheses, instances <clears throat> of that class. Oh. Instance variables, which I've been calling member variables, <clears throat> are specific to each object. If you have a way to change it, right? So if we did uh, self comma y so that we can pass in, well, there's some syntax errors, aren't there? But anyways, so when I make some samples, <clears throat> excuse me, S1's y is going to be 20 or 10, but his X value is going to be 33. S2's Y value is going to be 20, but his X value is also going to be 33.
So you see what I mean? All of these variables have the same X value. What happens if the X value gets changed? So like if we create an object and then we change X, is it gonna print that the X and the Y are 55 or is it gonna print that they're 33? Is the X value going to have been changed to 55 only for S2? Is it gonna be changed for both of them? Let's find out. Nope. It didn't even change it, right? This class variable up here is like a global variable that applies to the whole thing, to the whole module, excuse me, to the whole class. Even if you reassign it, apparently it doesn't change its value. It's still equal to 33. So this is a local variable right here that is lost as soon as this function executes. So if you do want class variables, you're allowed to have them. You know, class variables are variables that do not ever need to change, right? And so they, they are not, not specific to the class. They are not specific to any specific instance of it. So since that didn't work, but we can use it, right? We could print out, you know, while init x equals in comma x. Hopefully we'll at least see it say 33 there. All righty then. I guess I don't know what it, how to create a class variable in Python. Let's go look. So class variable is a name for a value that all instances of a class share in common. Pickling is the process of converting an object to a form that can be saved to a file. Well, in that special. So the class variable is the value that's shared across all class instances. The instance variable is the ones that are defined inside the init function preceded by init. Accessing the instance variable, you do it like that. Accessing the class variable, you do it via its class name. Well, isn't that interesting? That would mean that if I wanted to print out that class variable's name, value, and I wanted to see 33 there, I would have to do that. So anyways, you're allowed to define variables up here. And then when you want to reference them, you have to prefix them with the name of the class. 
And down here, that would work as well. I could print out the class variable in that fashion if I wanted to. I could say print out samples.x value, which is going to be 33, right? Or I could print it out like that. What happens if I change the x value so that it should no longer be 33? And then the second time we print it out, is it still going to be 33? If I change it for the X object, is it going to change it for the Y object? And the point of a class variable is that, okay, well, I'm surprised that it didn't change it at all. It's almost like a constant. It didn't change it at all. Well, anyways, going back to our quiz. An instance variable should be available in through the entire class. I hope that's the correct answer. I'm not digging uh, this quiz because it's talking about subclasses. A class variable is used for data that all instances of a class have in common. That's absolutely true. Right, that X variable was owned by all objects of that type. Now that I've deleted that ch change X thing, I'm gonna put it back in there, define, change X sample dot X equals X. So down here, I'm going to try to change the X value for it. One hundred. And then when I print it out, is it going to say that S two's X value is one hundred? Yes. So even though I called change.x on object S1, it also changed it for S2 because X is shared among all objects, every object that's derived from this class because it's not prefixed by the word self. If it said self.x, it becomes an instance variable which changes object by object. If there's no variable in front of it, if there's no self in front of it, then it applies to the class as its entirety. And if it's in a method and it doesn't have self in front of it, like if it has just, you know, Z is equal to 100, it's just a local variable that disappears when the method is done. A polymorphic method, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna undo this one as a required quiz. I should make my own quiz for this. So the name used to refer to the current instance of a class within the class is self. They're sneaky. They threw this one in to get the Java and the C++ programmers. But we use self in our class to represent our current object. The easiest way to save objects of permanent storage is An instance value refers to a data value that is writable only by the class and read only? No. It's shared in common and can be accessed by all instances? No, that's not an instance variable. It's owned by a particular instance of a class. That's an instance variable. All of those self dot variables that we've been creating were instance variables. Why do I have to scroll over here? All right, well, that was question 10. Okay. All righty, I think that is about enough of the chapter. I'm gonna go and remove that from being a, a mandatory test for you to take, right? And it's not, I wonder if I could come up with a way of making it extra credit.
Yeah, I'll figure out some way of assigning it as extra credit. I haven't figured out how to do that yet off the top of my head. Maybe I'll just make it so that you have to upload a picture, you know, telling me that the score that you got. And if you do upload a picture showing me a test score, you know, then you'll get that much extra credit for it. All righty. So did the homework make sense up here? You're going to write a book class. The book has five member variables. It's got those member variables. You're going to add getters. You're going to add setters and a string method to convert the book to a string. And you're going to make the class uh, your your main code. I'm sorry, I'm calling it client, but that's a common term for the code that uses a class. That's the client of the class. So have the main code create three different books, printing them out. We all good? Does that make sense? Yeah. All righty. I heard one of y'all say it, so I'm going to assume it is. So. Let's make a Dropbox and be done with that.